working. Is it me or, or is there more to say? No, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you. I was just waiting for the recording to come yeah, up. Just, um, okay, sorry, I, I wasn't. No, no. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, today we're um, delighted to be joined by Dr. Crispin Jordan, who was recently awarded um, the um, a teaching award from the um, College of Veterinary Medicine and Medicine. Um, so yeah, we're really delighted to, to have Chris, Crispin join us today and he's going to be talking about um, effect sizes and, and statistical power. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, I'm sure we're in for a great session and yeah, we encourage discussion as always and I will hand it over to, to Crispin to kick off discussion. Hi, uh, so I'm Crispin Jordan. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple, uh, a couple general comments to start. Um, first of all, what I'm, well, first of all, I should tell you, I'm going to be talking about some statistics, but I'm not a statistician. Um, I teach experimental design and data analysis in the School of Bio Biomedical Science at this university. Um, but my training is as a biologist. So my training is in ecology and evolution and genetics. Um, and that's where I learned a lot of the things I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, the other thing to note is uh, it's a bit embarrassing to say that, uh, you know, I just got this teaching award because I'm not gonna be practicing best practice with this talk. Um, I'm breaking one of my cardinal rules of packing too much in. Um, so apologies in advance for that. Um, it was, it was, I was thinking more about um, the fact that there's so many important things to say, and I was worried about uh, missing out on something important, and I was taking it on faith that everyone's going to be able to keep up. Um, so if I've miscalculated, I apologize in advance, and we can hopefully clean that up in questions at the end. Um, last thing is, if you hear someone coughing in the background, my seven-year-old is home from school just behind me. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Lois. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about effect sizes today from three different perspectives. And I just want to start by saying this slide here shows how most people think about results. We, it's kind of dogma in much of empirical science to look for a specific p-value that's compared to a specific threshold value. And if it's less than that particular threshold, then we wave our hands and we get excited and we publish something. Um, next slide, please. But in 2019, uh, something radical happened where the American Statistical Association, after years and years of discussion, and years of debate, they have put their foot down and said we should no longer be using this threshold perspective when interpreting our results. There should be, we should never again be using the word statistically significant, and we should never again be deciding or making conclusions based on whether or not a p-value is greater than or less than some threshold value. So we're going to start this talk by talking about why that is, and what we should do instead. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna briefly talk about um, some work that um, was presented in two papers in 2019. So this is one of them, uh, says Retire Statistical Significance um, by Ammerheim et al. I apologize to the author for butchering their pronunciation. And next slide, please. And this paper, coup de grasse for tuffled bowl, statistically significant expires. Um, this paper by Stuart Hurlbert is, uh, and others, um, Stuart is one of the people who in the 80s really drew a lot of attention to the phenomenon of pseudo-replication. Uh, next slide, please. So the thing to point out is from both of these papers, um, sorry, the, both of those papers are written by biologists. So they're not written by people who are trained as statisticians, although they are very statistically savvy. And also the arguments that are in these papers that I'm gonna make are not new. They've been around for decades. So next slide, please. So first we wanna introduce the idea of what is an effect size. Um, basically we can think of an effect size as the estimated size of an effect that we're interested in detecting. 
So if we have an experiment where we have two different groups and we're comparing the mean of those groups, then we can think of the effect size as the difference between those means. If we're fitting a, slot, a, a line through some data, like with a regression, then the slope of that line would be uh, a measure of effect size. Or we might say, what's the probability of recovery after receiving a drug, et cetera. It's these kinds of effects that have been quantified that I refer to as effect size. We can, we can think of effect size in standardized forms, but um, I'm not going to be talking about effect size in those standardized forms because, well, for reasons we can talk about at the end, if you'd like, uh, when we have questions. Okay, so I'm just thinking about raw effect sizes. Next slide, please. So here is the decades old practice of uh, how people often think about the results. We often say if a p-value is less than some threshold, which is usually 0 0.05, and we say our result is statistically significant, if it's greater than that, then we say it's statistically non-significant, okay? I wanna point out that the arguments that I'm going to make do not criticize the use of p-values. P-values themselves are extremely useful. What I'm criticizing is the practice of comparing a p-value against an arbitrary threshold like 0.05. Okay, next slide, please. So why is statistical significance really unhelpful? Why is that concept unhelpful? And we're going to explore this by example. And I've taken this example straight out of the Ammerheim paper that I pointed to. Um, there were two recent studies that both looked at, that were both looking for the side effects of a drug where the side effect would be the onset of atrial fibrillation. So that's where your heart is beating irregularly. And there were two studies that looked at this. And in the first study, they found a statistically significant association between receiving the drug and the onset of atrial fibrillation. So in other words, they found statistically significant evidence that receiving the drug um, tends to increase the frequency of atrial fibrillation. So this is evidence for there being a side effect. In the second study, they found a statistically non-significant association between the drug and the onset of atrial fibrillation. And the researchers claimed that these results were contradictory. Next slide, please. But this is what the data actually looks like. So I'll just orient you to this slide. Um, so along the x-axis here, we have estimates of the risk ratio, which gives us um, a sense of how much more likely we are to experience or exhibit um, atrial fibrillation when you receive the drug. And the, the vertical line that we have there, kind of in the middle of the slide, at that point along the x-axis, that's where we say there's no effect, okay? And what I want you to see is the, you have the blue points and the red point, and the blue point is the estimate of the risk ratio for the onset of atrial fibrillation from the first study that found a significant effect. And then around that, we have 95% confidence intervals for our estimate of that effect. And then we have the same thing in red for the other study, which did not find a significant association. So there's two things to notice here. One is that the blue study was able to measure the risk ratio more precisely. Okay, so they might have had a larger sample size. We don't know exactly the reasons for this, but you can see that their, the range of their confidence intervals is much reduced. So the confidence intervals you can think of as being a range of plausible values for an estimate, very loosely speaking. And so they have a more precise estimate than we have for the red. And the red lines you see end up crossing that vertical line. And that's the reason why they found a non-significant association. That's one thing to notice. That explains the difference between the significance. But the effect sizes based on the point estimates, so based on those averages, are identical. And so based on this measure of the effect size, we can see there's absolutely no difference between these studies. And uh, next slide, please. So here's what the authors had to say about this. They had to, or the authors of the Ammerheim paper. 
It said it is ludicrous to conclude that the statistically non-significant results showed no association when the interval estimate included serious risk increases. So what they're talking about there is to look at the full range of that blue bar with the confidence interval. And the blue bars, um, if you go, can you go back a slide just for a moment? Sorry, I, I, I meant red bar. So the red bar is very wide. It does cross the line where we have no effect, but it also goes up really high. And that really high portion of the red bar should really cause alarm because that suggests that there's a very sizable risk of atrial fibrillation with this drug. Okay, ne next slide again, please. And that's what they're talking about there. We say the, the interval estimate included serious risk increases. They say it's equally absurd to claim that these results were in contrast with the earlier results showing an identical observed effect. Yet, these common practices show that reliance on threshold of statistical significance can mislead us. So, next slide, please. So, why do these kinds of conclusions or mis misunderstandings arise? And I'm going to point out two likely sources. The first is a misunderstanding that a p-value of greater than 0 0.05 means no effect. So, next slide, please. That's where we'll start. It's very commonly misunderstood to think that a large p-value means that we have no, that we have evidence there being no effect. And this is simply is not true. And I just want to walk through a few uh, thought experiments here in the slides to, to make that clear. The first is just a, an act of simple logic where we can recognize that an effect might actually be present, it might actually be real, but that effect might just be very small making it difficult to detect. And as a result, you'd end up getting large p-values, especially if your, power, if your experiment is underpowered. So it's always possible that there is an effect present, but that it's just too small to detect. The second thought experiment goes like this. Let's imagine that if a p-value greater than 0 0.05 did actually mean that there was no effect, okay? In other words, let's imagine that we lived in a world such that if p-values greater than 0 0.05 truly did tell us that there was no effect. What that would mean is that small experiments, which have very little power to detect an effect, would be excellent at showing no effect. That's clearly not, uh, that clearly doesn't match with our intuition and understanding of statistics, okay? The third way to think about this is to say that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Okay, so three ways of thinking about this, just driving home the point that p-values greater than 0 0.05 does not mean no effect. Next slide, please. So here's a question. If having a p-value greater than 0 0.05 does not actually mean that there's no effect, then what purpose does it serve to compare a p-value against a critical value like 0 0.05? Next slide, please. I'd say none. And it's exactly what the American Statistical Association is arguing as well. Uh, next slide, please. The second reason for this kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding comes from a strong tendency to dichotomize the kinds of conclusions that we reach in our studies. So we tend to conclude, is there an effect or isn't there an effect? And I think that people do this because it's an attractive thing to do. It's, and it's attractive because it's simple. But just because something's simple does not mean that it's right. And it also doesn't mean that it's a good thing to do. So when we have this kind of dichotomous way of thinking about our results, this has three different consequences. It oversimplifies our interpretation. It also tends to lead to bias in the reported results in the literature. And it will promote questionable research habits in, uh, as people search for that elusive statistical significance and being able to put a star over an effect in a figure. Next slide, please. So what can we do about this? There's three things that we can do. The first thing is to never, ever, ever again use the term statistically significant or any of its variants, okay? The second thing is to continue using p-values, but to interpret them on a sliding scale of evidence. This is actually the way that Ronald Fisher first intended people to use p-values. So what do I mean by that? 
what I mean is we could say the p-values that tend to be large, so say 0 0.2, 0 0.1, larger than that, those would represent weak evidence for an effect, okay? That we're not saying there's no effect, we're saying there's weak evidence for an effect. There's good statistical arguments to say that if you have a p-value of around 0 0.005, so an extra zero in there, then that's commonly thought to be, or that's thought to be evidence consistent with substantial evidence for an effect, for an effect or strong evidence for an effect. So if you have p-values that are around 0 0.005 or smaller, then you might interpret those as strong evidence for an effect. That same body of theory tells us that p-values around 0 0.05 actually only constitute about moderate evidence for an effect. That, that's my choice of term, um, but that, that's, that's my take on, on, on the theory, okay? So p-values of around 0 0.05 are not considered strong evidence for an effect, and we need to be clear in our understanding of that. The third thing is to really make use of other sources of evidence when drawing our conclusions. And we're gonna focus on effect size. That's what we've been leading up to, okay? So next slide, please. So here's uh, just results from a t-test. I just simulated some data. Um, and these are some results from a t-test I performed in R. And there's a couple of things I want to draw your attention to here. So I just imagined that this result came from an experiment where we had a drug group and a control group. And you can see in the output here at the bottom, we have the mean value of the control, the mean value of the drug group. And if we just subtract the means from those two different groups, then we can get an effect size that's equal to roughly negative two, okay? Um, the fact that it's a negative doesn't really matter here, okay? Because the way R goes about calculating this is it just arbitrarily chooses one mean and divides the other mean from it. And so whether or not you get positive or negative values just depends on which treatment it decided to use first, okay? So our effect size in this case is two. You can also see that R gives you um, a 95% confidence interval for that effect size, which lies right in the middle of this output, which says 95% confidence interval, which ranges from about four to 0 0.05, okay? So when we're reporting our results, what we should do is we think about how important is this effect size? Is this effect size biologically relevant? Or if you're a psychologist, is it relevant for your particular perspective of science for the phenomena that you're interested in? And then to consider the end points of those 95% confidence intervals and say, for this upper range of the 95% confidence interval and the lower range, what are the scientific implications of those effect sizes? How do we interpret those functionally in terms of trying to understand, is this effect an important size of an effect for our understanding of the system we're looking into? Next slide, please. Um, I just wanna point out here that the choice of using 95% confidence intervals as opposed to say 99% confidence intervals is an arbitrary choice just like comparing a p-value against 0 0.05 is an arbitrary choice. So I wanna point out that there's nothing magical about the endpoints of these confidence intervals. Um, if we were to step just outside those confidence intervals, we'd interpret those values similarly to values we had just within the ends of those confidence intervals. Okay, next slide, please. So this leads us to a really difficult question. What if we do, what do we do if we don't actually know the practical importance of an effect size? One of the really nice things about thinking about um, our results from this simplistic way of saying, do we have an effect or do we not have an effect? One of the really nice, sorry, just a second. Sorry, just distracted. One of the really nice, or, or I shouldn't say nice, one of the attractive features of that framework is that it makes everything really simple. It means that we can just say we have an effect, we don't have an effect. And we don't actually have to stop and think about whether or not that effect is actually a meaningful effect. So using the threshold approach gives us a really simple way of thinking about our results 
but it's probably not a very meaningful way of thinking about our results. So back to the question on this slide. What do we do if we don't actually know the practical importance of the effect? Well, what I want to point out here is that we don't actually know the practical importance of the effect. So if we get an effect size and we don't know whether or not it's important, an, an, an important effect size for our field, then what that tells us is it tells us about a source of ignorance within our field. If we don't know whether or not an effect of a given size is important for our phenomenon that we're trying to understand, that's a big arrow, a big finger pointing at a huge gap in the knowledge of our understanding for that area of research. And so what we need to do is we need to think about whether or not that effect size would be important. We need to acknowledge our lack of understanding and what that would do, hopefully, would lead us to adopt to other research that would directly address that question to understand what is the importance of a, of a larger versus smaller effect than we found for the phenomenon we want to understand. Next figure, please. Okay, so this leads us to kind of a very nice dichotomy, which is to point out that p-values do not tell us how important a result is. That comes from the effect size. And so we can think about our results in terms of statistical significance versus, I've written this, I've said biological significance because I'm a biologist, but I'll just say versus scientific significance, depending on your field of study. So next slide, please. So this was an example that we talked about earlier, where we had, um, in red, we had um, a result that was not statistically significant, but that was very biologically significant, okay? So just because you have a large p-value, that doesn't mean that you have low importance. Next slide, please. Here's an opposite scenario from my own area of research. So uh, I study things like the evolution of sexual dimorphism, so why females and males are different. And this comes from a field, from a paper in that field. And what they've done is they've used genomic data to um, try to look for signals of natural selection, which we can quantify using a metric called Tajima's D. And that's what we have along the y-axis, along the y-axis here. I want you to focus on the figures with the box plots. And they've created box plots for three different groups of genes that, depend, that differ with respect to how the genes are expressed. They're either um, female biased genes or male biased genes or unbiased genes. And you can see that there is this star over the blue box on the left, saying that we have a significant difference between male biased genes and the other groups. I have no idea whether or not this result is actually biologically meaningful because the effect size they identify here is so, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I don't even know whether or not um, it's a, in a quantitative sense, it looks like a, a small effect size, but I have no idea whether or not this small quantitative effect is a small effect size in terms of the biology. That's something that I don't know, and this is not something that the, the author is completely don't talk about. So presumably they don't know the answer either. Okay, so here's an example of something where we have a small p-value, but where the importance could potentially be also very small. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a summary for the first part. Okay, so there's three parts. So first of all, we should think about a size of a p-value as a degree of evidence for an effect along a sliding scale and forget about this concept of statistical significance. Remember, this is the American Statistical Association saying this. This is not just my opinion. This is, I'm, I'm reporting what other people have said. Um, I just happen to agree with it. Um, the other main point here is that effect sizes, they are what tell us whether or not something is scientifically important. Okay, next slide, please. So what I want to do now is shift gears and talk about effect sizes in the context of power analyses. Uh, next slide. Um, before I go any further, this is a new book that came out by Nick Colgrave and Graham Ruxton. It's a brilliant book. It's thin. Uh, I've got it right here. So you can see it's 
not a thick book. It's written for undergraduates, but I guarantee, unless you're already a master of power analysis, I guarantee it'll be really useful for you. Um, it talks about how to do power analyses using approaches and simulations, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll make use of it at the end of this talk. It's, it's I'm just give me a plug for this book. It's really good. Uh, and it's where I draw a lot of my understanding about power analysis from. Next slide, please. So before we talk about effect sizes in power analysis, let's briefly review what statistical power is. Um, I'm not going to be giving statistical power the full treatment it deserves, but that's just because I want to focus on effect sizes. So statistical power refers to the probability of our being able to detect an effect, assuming that there is one there to detect in the first place. Okay, next slide, please. And statistical power depends on three things. It depends on the size of the effects that we're interested in detecting. So a larger effect will tend to lead to larger statistical power. It depends on the amount of variation in our data. So that's like your residual variation or your error variance, if you're doing something like a, a one-way ANOVA. And it also depends on our sample size. Next slide, please. So when we conduct a power analysis, Arguably, the most difficult aspect of a power analysis is deciding on a relevant effect size. What effect size should we use in our power analysis? And I want to make, make this argument about how to choose your effect size. You should choose the smallest effect size that you think is actually scientifically relevant for your field. <laughs> Why would we take that approach? Why would we want to detect that the smallest effect size would actually be of scientific interest? We take that approach because it puts us in a beautiful situation. If we design our experiments to have high power to detect the smallest effect that we're interested in from a scientific point of view, then what that allows us to do is to say that if we fail to detect an effect, then we are in a strong position to say that if there is an effect present, but we failed to detect it, then we're in a strong position to argue that that effect is going to be so small that we could argue that it's scientifically unimportant for our field of research. And when we take that perspective, that means that any results that we obtain from a study that we've designed with this framework will be scientifically meaningful for our field. And I think that's an incredibly powerful approach. Next slide, please. Okay. So now I'm going to walk you through a few different ways to try and reach that conclusion. To how, how would we decide on a, uh, a, an effect size that's the smallest that we would actually consider to be important? In some cases, that decision is really easy. So, for example, imagine you're developing a new drug or a new vaccine. Um, I'm not an expert on this, um, but my naive impression would be that we would want a new vaccine to be at least as effective as a previously existing vaccine. And so probably we might do something like select the effect size we want to be able to detect to be the effect size of the previous drug. Okay, so that would be a, a, an example where we have um, a clear benchmark to set our power analysis against. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is just to remind you, so this is the, 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 the difficult situation that I was pointed to on a, on a couple of slides ago, but I've just pulled out the, the box plot um, and highlighted on this figure. I just wanted to point out again that sometimes effect sizes can be very difficult to interpret because we lack the scientific knowledge to know a priori what a scientifically meaningful effect size would be. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So I've lost my train of thought very slightly here. Um, 
So the, the, the point that I want to make here just kind of follows on from this question of how we try and choose the smallest effect size that might interest us. Okay, This slide just really makes the same points that I made earlier, where if we don't know what effect size would actually be meaningful for our field, then this just highlights an area of ignorance in our field. Okay, And so I'm just pointing out that, again, this is something that we might think is being discouraging, but I would actually would argue is actually really encouraging because what this does is this points to us to an area of research that needs to be addressed. The point that I make in the bottom of this slide though is uh, kind of another perspective on this where if we don't actually know what effect size would be scientifically relevant, then I ask you to all consider just on your own, how useful would a p-value be in that case? If you don't actually know what effect size would be relevant for your field, then is it meaningful to obtain a p-value in the first place? I don't know. Something we could talk about. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to give you three quick thoughts on how to choose an effect size um, when it's not really clear what effect size might be meaningful. Okay, so... Um, the first is to consider a role for theory. So next slide, please. So in my own area of research, so in ecology and evolution, those fields are rich with theory. They're very model-based areas of research, but also empirically rich as well. And what a lot of people have done is they've developed mathematical models to try and understand the phenomenon that we're interested in. So, for example, you might be familiar with the term local adaptation. Um, this refers to a case where um, individuals that have certain genes might be able to perform better in one environment or in one population than in another environment. And that's because they've adapted to the local conditions of that population, okay? Whereas their genes are not uh, really suitable to perform as well in another population or another location. There's been a lot, of, if we wanted to perform an empirical study of this, then we could make use of some mathematical models of this phenomenon of local adaptation, because what these models tell us is we expect local adaptation to occur based on a balance between a number of different processes. So, Local adaptation is usually believed to occur when you have a balance between the rate of migration of individuals between populations and the strength of natural selection. So let's imagine that you were in a situation where you had some data that gave you a good guess of the rate of migration between populations, and you were designing a study where you wanted to estimate natural selection, okay? But you didn't know what a relevant effect size for natural selection might be. You might go to the theory to understand, saying, if, I, if my rate of migration is this, what does the theory tell me about what a relevant level of natural selection would be as an effect size that I should be looking for? Okay, And theory, I think, is a beautiful way to answer these kinds of questions that I raised before about saying, what do you do if you don't know the relevance of an effect size? Theory can be a great approach to answer that kind of question. Next slide, please. Um, so here's another approach for choosing an effect size, where what I advocate is we can just change the nature of our scientific question. Let's imagine that we were interested in studying some particular phenomenon. So let's imagine we were interested in studying some physiological process, maybe rate of metabolism, okay? And let's imagine that we already had a lot of data in the literature that looks at that phenomenon in one context. So let's imagine that we were, have lots of data that compare that phenomenon, so like physiology, um, between females and males. So we have some sense of sex, and I'm using sex in a biological definition, so based on gamete size. That's how evolutionary biologists define sex, where females are the individuals that produce large gametes, so eggs and males are the ones that chew, that produce basically um, very cheap, tiny bags of DNA, which are sperm or pollen. Okay, so that, that's my definition of sex. And so I put two plants here from a species of plant that has separate sexes. 
And so let's imagine that we were studying this phenomenon in this species, and we already had a good sense of how that phenomenon differs between females and males. What we might do then is, let's say we were interested in how stress influences this phenomenon. We might decide on our effect size in terms of a relative effect size. If we already knew the effect size of sex on our phenomenon, then we might say, okay, I want to know um, about the effect of sex, I'm oh, sorry, about the effect of stress relative to the effect size of sex. So for example, I might say that I'm interested in being able to detect an effect of sex that is at least half as large as the effect of sex, okay? And when you do that, what you're doing is you're asking a relative biological question. So we're kind of weighing up the contribution of different types of factors for a particular phenomenon, okay? So that's another way of thinking about our scientific question when we define our effect size. Next slide, please. The last thing we could do is we could decide on an effect size based on previous research. Um, that might seem really intuitive, it should be, but I, I want to warn everyone because very often it's known that in many areas of study, um, the power of the studies that are published are much lower than would be ideal. And it's well known that small, that underpowered studies tend to inflate the effect sizes that are reported. Um, and so if you're obtaining your effect sizes from studies that could be underpowered, then you need to be aware of the fact that those effect sizes that are reported very well could be upwardly biased. And you need to take that into consideration when you're designing your power analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a summary of part two. Um, what I argue is that we want to choose the smallest effect size for a power analysis that's of scientific interest. When we do that, our results will always be scientifically interesting. Um, <coughs> the other thing that I want to point out here is that this, the decisions that we're making here are much more about biology or science than they are about statistics. So the hardest aspect of a power analysis is not based on statistics. The statistics is easy. The hardest part is thinking about your scientific question. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I would like to do now is I want to give you um, a whole other way of thinking about power analyses that do not use this criterion of p values being less than 0 0.05, because you've probably picked up on um, a discrepancy within this talk. I started by saying that we should not use p-values less than 0 0.05 to interpret our results. Yet, I didn't go into this, but yet, power analyses most commonly are based on the premise of being able to define or being able to find a p-value that is less than 0 0.05. When we have um, a study with 80% power, that's typically calculated by determining our ability or our power to obtain a p-value that's less than 0 0.05. So clearly those perspectives are at odds, at least apparently. Next slide, please. Here's how I resolve that apparent discrepancy. Remember I was talking before about how we consider p-values um, along a spectrum. I consider p-values of 0 0.05 to be mod evidence for a moderate Sorry, I consider p-values around 0 0.05 to constitute moderate evidence for an effect. So if I perform a power analysis using this threshold approach of comparing p-values versus 0 0.05, then my interpretation is this. If I have 80% power based on this criterion, I would say that we have 80% power, that that means we have a high probability of detecting at least moderate evidence for an effect. Okay, that's how I interpret this in a way that allows us to reconcile these two different perspectives. Next slide, please. What I'd like to end, though, is with uh, a suggestion for a whole other approach to conducting a power analysis.
And that is we can conduct a power analysis rather than focusing on having a, a p-value of a particular size to say we have a successful experiment. Instead, instead, we can conduct our power analysis in such a way where we want to aim to have a certain level of precision when we're estimating our effect size. And we can base our decision on whether or not we have sufficient precision upon the standard error that we can calculate for our effect size. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's imagine, so I've got this very fancy figure here. Okay, let's imagine that we were, uh, imagine, let's imagine we wanted to have, to be able to detect an effect size we thought was around equal to one. Okay, so for example, let's imagine we had two different groups and we want to compare the mean of our two groups. And we thought the difference between those means was around one unit. Okay, so that's why I have this one dot here that lies at the one point along the y-axis. Next slide, please. Okay. We could design our experiment so that we could try to estimate that effect size to a certain level of precision. And we can define that precision based on the range of our 95% confidence intervals, which present a range of plausible values for the thing we're estimating. So we're estimating an effect size. Next slide, please. I want you, you may not know this. If you don't, you can learn this. Very roughly speaking, in particular, when we have large sample size, um, a 95% confidence interval can be approximated as about twice the size of a standard error. So if we wanted to um, define a certain level of precision for estimating this effect size, we could do it by specifying the size of, an, of a standard error for this effect size, because we can then quickly translate that standard error into a confidence interval. Next slide, please. Okay. When we take this approach, what we're doing is we can, when we're, what we're doing when we conduct a power analysis to decide on a sample size, is we're asking ourselves, what sample size do I need to be able to estimate an effect with a standard error of that effect size that's smaller than a certain value that we specify, say 80% of the time, where 80% would represent a high powered experiment. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, actually uh, go back for a moment. So what I'm imagining here is a situation where let's, let's say we wanted to be able to measure this effect size with confidence intervals of around 0.7. So that would mean that we'd want to generate error bars, so confidence intervals that range from about 1.7, which we get from adding 0.7 to this value of one and going up, and subtracting 0.7 from that to go down to a value of 0.3. Likewise, this would mean that we would be um, conducting our power analysis based on um, uh, an effect so based on a standard error that we calculate for an effect size of equal to 0 0.35. Okay, um, next slide, please. Actually, we're gonna skip this and next slide and next slide. Um, and next slide, because I want to give people an option. Um, I realize I've run out of the usual time. So actually, yes, I'm just, what I'm gonna do here is this. Um, I just want to summarize what we can do, and then I'm going to give you an option for how we can proceed. Um, what I was going to do, and what, what I can still do, is I can show you in R how to conduct a power analysis based on um, using, based on our ability to obtain an estimate of an effect size to a certain level of precision. Okay, and that's what I've highlighted here in this first uh, summary point, where we can use criteria other than p-values of less than 0.05 as our criterion for power. And you can do that, say, by specifying precision. One of the things that I wanted to show you um, through simulations is that in some cases, so for certain types of analyses, that ability to generate a certain um, level of precision. So to be able to estimate a standard error for an effect size actually is completely independent of the effect size itself. 
In other words, if you're doing something like a t-test, the designing the experiments that gives you a certain level of precision does, is not associated in any way with the actual effect size of that experiment. And that's extremely useful because what that means is that if we focus our power analysis on trying to estimate an effect size to a certain level of precision, then we can completely circumvent this whole issue of how big should our effect size be, at least for certain types of analyses and for certain types of data. So just to say that again, if we focus our power analysis on being able to estimate an effect size to a certain level of precision, we completely avoid this question of trying to decide what effect size would be of interest when we're conducting our power analysis. And instead, we focus our experiment on being able to estimate that effect size as well as we can. And then we find out what we get, okay? I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna, because I know I've gone over time, um, and I'll give you the option of either asking questions, or if you want to see how we can conduct these power analyses in R, I'm glad to show you, okay? So Neve, yeah, what do you think? Because my yeah. thought would be, um, might be interesting to see actually the demonstration if we can, and then collect yeah. uh, questions in the chat. And yeah. I was hoping, Crispin, maybe if we run out of time for this session, would you mind if we send you the questions? And then maybe we could uh, send the the questions and answers in the Teams chat afterwards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's fine. That would be okay if that would suit people. Yeah, as long as people don't mind some abbreviated answers, depending on how many questions there are. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, I think the, the demo will be great and a good resource as well to have. So um, if people do have to go at 12, like, please feel free to, to leave the call. But we'll have a recording up on our YouTube channel of this anyway, so you can catch up at a later stage. But it would be fab to see see yeah. the demo or um, if you have um, time, Crispin. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got the code already set up. Oh, great. It's a question of walking through it. Yeah, that sounds okay. good. So can I close your PowerPoint? Yes, please. Yeah, that's fine. OK. All right. All right, so hopefully this will work. I should tell you my computer is 12 years old. Um, I've taken very good care of it. I love it very much. Um, but it does mean that sometimes things are a bit slow. Oh, okay, can you see R now? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to show you how to conduct a power analysis using simulations um, for a simple experiment where we imagine that we have just two different groups that we want to compare. Okay, so we're just going to be using a t-test. Oh, this is uh, not the code that I thought it was. All right, I'm going to. Uh, this is code that I have for a different phenomenon. Uh, let me just see if I can call up. You know what? I'm just going to edit this code. Okay, I'm just going to do this on the fly. All right, so ignore some of the code that's up here. What, you're hi what I'm highlighting here is the first things that we need when conducting a power analysis is that really we want to have a sense of our effect size. Okay, and that's what I'm specifying here. So I'm just specifying a mean value for one group, which I'm saying is uh, mean value is five, and imagine the mean value for the other group is equal to six, okay? And then we're gonna say that the standard deviation within each of these groups is equal to 0 0.05, okay? So that gives us the amount of variation that we have within our, uh, within our data, okay? Um, what we need now is we need to know how many times we're going to run this. I'm going to say we're going to run our simulations 10,000 times. I'm creating this variable here, nsims, um, and I'm going to create a counter, which I'm just going to set to zero. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to randomly generate data using 
the function R norm, which just allows us to randomly select data from a normal distribution. Um, this is a very sensible thing to do when we think we're going to have normally distributed data, because if you think about it, if your data are normally distributed and you have two different treatments, and we're imagining that our two different treatments have two different mean values, and we're imagining that our two different treatments have a specific standard deviation, then when we're conducting our experiment, what we're essentially imagining that we're doing is we're taking samples from a population that has a particular mean and a particular standard deviation, okay? That's essentially what we're imagining that we're doing when we're running an experiment, but we're just selecting maybe rats or plants, okay? What we're doing in this case is we are um, just pulling out random numbers where those numbers represent the measurements that we would obtain from those uh, subjects, okay? So we're just generating data that specify, um, that basically represent the data that we would obtain from our subjects. Uh, I'm now just specifying a sample size. So I'm saying our sample size is going to be five. Okay. So what I've done here is let's just run this code. Okay. Um, let's just run the counter. Okay. What I've done here is I'm saying we can now pull out five random numbers using this R norm where we specify the mean value and the standard deviation for each of our different treatments. And so you should see here five random numbers that I've drawn from the first group. And I can do that again for the second group, okay? Now, when I do that, I'm just gonna save those data in these objects, which I'm just calling data one and data two, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is just take those data and store them, put them into a t-test and then we're just going to run a, a t-test on those data and save the output in an object which we call t out. Okay. So now, if we look at the output from t out, here's what we get. Okay. So we get a p-value here, which is equal to 0 0.011111. We can get estimates of our confidence intervals, yada yada yada. What I'd like to point out is we can pull out the value of the p-value from this output specifically. And we can do that like this, okay? We specify the object that has our output from the t-test, and we just say dollar sign p-value, and then we just ask whether our p-value is less than 0 0.05, okay? I'm jumping ahead a little bit by saying this, okay? Um, Here's what we want to do. We want to run our t-test based on our simulated data. We want to ask whether or not our p-value is less than 0 0.05. And if it is, then we're going to increment our counter. Oops. This is increment our counter. And then we're just going to repeat this process 10,000 times. Okay. Now, hopefully I've done everything right here. And if we just run this, we're just going to go through this process 10,000 times. And what we should get is, I already know what this should be. There we go. So we, I've done this before, and this, uh, this is what we expect to get. In this scenario, for an experiment with this level of standard error, sorry, with this level of standard deviation of 0 0.5 within our groups, and with an effect size is equal to one and a sample size of five, we can see that we have a 76% probability of getting a p-value of less than 0 0.05. This means that we essentially have about 76% power based on this convention of comparing our p-values against 0 0.05, okay? Now, how would we change this if we wanted to instead look at the standard error, so to be able to create uh, 
or design experiments to be able to estimate your effect size to a certain level of precision, we only have to change one thing. Instead of pulling out the p-value, just pull out standard error, where this is the estimate of the standard error of our effect size. And let's say we want our standard error to be less than 0 0.35. Which is what I suggested before. Yeah. If we said Can we I just there. interrupt there, Crispin? Yeah. So, so I'm struggling to follow this. So the the, the that's the standard error of the effect size. Yep. But the claim is that it's that this is utterly independent of a p value that would be calculated in a conventional sense. No, it's not independent of the p value. Let me right. let me show you this. So I'll just demonstrate. Okay. It's independent of the effect size. Okay. So let's run this. Oops. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Uh... Oh my God. This is totally weird. Do you know what? Uh, I was doing this just the other day on my other computer, and it allows me to choose the standard error of the effect size. And that's because I think I'm using a more recent version of R on my other computer. Um, so I can't actually show you what I wanted um, because what do we do if we get, if I get this? Okay, I can't actually show you what I wanted because I didn't expect that this wasn't available from my version of R. Um, I'll tell you what we would have seen, okay? What we would have seen is that I could run this code if I had been using more up-to-date version of R, and we'd end up getting a power of around 72%, okay? So that would mean that if we were designing our experiment based on this criterion, then we would have about a 72% chance of obtaining a standard error for our effect size um, that was smaller than this level. Now back to your question, the thing that this standard error is independent from is the effect size. So what I was gonna show you is that I could change this mean value for the second group to being something in the millions. So we go from having an effect size of one to an effect size of something like 60 million. And that power will not change. And that's because the standard error of the effect size is independent of the size of the effect itself. Okay, that the standard error is not independent. The standard error of the effect size is not independent of the p-value. Those two things are, inter, are intimately linked but the standard error of the effect size is independent of the effect size itself, okay? And so because this is independent of the mean values we have up here, at least for t-tests, then that means that we can go about a power analysis based on this criterion for precision without having to think about the actual effect size, okay? Um, apologies, I, I couldn't actually run this. I did not anticipate this difference in the in the versions of R. Um, that's what I wanted to show you. Great, that was that was super useful, Crispin. Yeah, I feel like you never really know what kind of uh, issues different versions of R will show, but it was really helpful just to kind of see a worked example of, of what to do for sure. Okay, I'm glad. Great. I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah. Um,